Well, a, a very pleasant evening and a warm welcome, and thank you for joining us on our fourth annual Regional Program Information Night. My name is John Colton. I am the principal at Central Peel Secondary School, and it's my absolute pleasure to see so many of you here this evening and welcome you to learn about the amazing programs being offered at Central Peel Secondary School. We have a very active and informative evening planned for you. Right now, we have so many potential students and families with us that this auditorium is full, and we have moved out into the cafeteria and even into our classrooms. We are now, just so you know, being streamed live on all the other locations and in our classrooms on Peel TV. You'll notice we have a camera at the back, so this is live throughout the board. Why are we all here tonight? Well, I'll take a moment to give you a basic overview of the history and guiding principles behind our two regional programs. That's advanced placement and our strings. And then we're gonna talk a little bit, about, a little bit more in depth about those programs and talk about if you are the proper fit, and I believe that most of you are. So, five years ago, Central Peel developed a new mission. Oh, I gotta use this. Here we go. Five years ago, Central Peel developed a new mission, vision, and values to better serve the student body and extend outwards towards the city of Brampton. Through our regional programs, we would focus on enrichment opportunities, experiences not found within the regular classroom settings, things like field trips and, and speakers, equipment, resources, and technology. In fact, next year, we're planning a return trip to Vimy Ridge in France, and uh, students would be eligible to attend that, uh, and that, there's going to be an information night coming, upcoming in November for that. Um, focus on a rigorous approach to learning is divided between practical knowledge and a joy for learning. We believe that students, staff, parents all form a learning community driven by passion, curiosity, and a deep intellectual and emotional commitment. The students we accept to join our regional programs are very motivated, hardworking, and committed to academic excellence. Stand this way. So, the goals of the regional program here at Central Peel are to create a learning environment to challenge highly motivated students, encourage deep inquiry, independence, and collaboration, support and promote academic excellence, create knowledgeable, reflective, positive citizens, which all contribute to overall success. Another key thing here at Central Peel is 21st century teaching and learning. Five years were spent developing this model at Central Peel, and this is our learning framework. At the center is the 21st century learner. This learner is supported by, you, you can't really see it, so I'll just talk you through it, uh, critical thinking, collaboration, and I have to look at my screen to make sure I don't miss any. probably best if I don't squint. But again, this uh, poster is available in all of our classrooms, and the idea is the 21st century learner is supported by a very detailed way of thinking. This way of thinking is there then supported by the amazing classroom activities that go on in our rooms, the amazing technology, and the amazing experiences that we provide for them. It is the core learning framework for the students here at Central Peel, and it's a core learning model adopted by our staff. Central Peel students and staff work together as a team. They learn and problem solve together. If you have not already done so, please take a look around at the sheer number of staff that are here tonight, joining us to present and share our wonderful programs with you. On another note, Central Peel is the first and only uniform school, public school in Peel. The uniform is a critical component of our learning model here at Central Peel. I joined Central Peel last year in February, and I was, I was unsold. I was, you know, uniform could be good, could be bad, I wasn't sure yet. But coming into the building, the tremendous difference that the uniform makes for our students is incredible. When you walk into the classrooms, there's just a tone. When you walk through the hallways, there's a really positive tone. And most importantly, when our students go out into the community and they're wearing our Central Peel uniforms, and our students, trust me, they're amazing, they're positive, they're caring, they're kind. They go out into the community, they go for lunch, they buy a piece of pizza, they might visit a park, they might talk to a community member. And all those people recognize that those kind, caring individuals are Central Peel students. And it's changing the image of Central Peel in our community and within Peel. Because our students are a wonderful student body, and now the word is getting out. 
So inside the building, it makes a difference, and outside of the building. So I'm very pleased that we are now in year two of the adoption of our uniform program. We are the first advanced placement AP program in Peel, and that's the, uh, one of the topics we're going to be speaking in detail about tonight. And I'm sure a lot of you are very interested in what advanced placement's all about. And we are the first regional strings program in Peel. And strings is musical, and we have uh, four different disciplines within that. But again, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to let you see and hear about those programs. So at this time, I'd like to take a moment to introduce the head of my arts and technology program. I'd like to call up Ms. Megan Collings to introduce our, our regional program on strings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colton. Good evening, everyone. As Mr. Colton said, my name is Megan Collings. I am the head of the Arts and Technology Program, as well as a music teacher here at Central Peel. I count myself to be very, very fortunate. I'm uh, new to the school this year, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be part of the Regional Strings Program. This program I found just in the short time I've been here um, is very unique. It offers a foundation of um, musicianship and you know, basic music concepts but it also has been carefully designed to include experiences and use of technological advances that are not present in many other music programs within the board. This program is currently only in its third year. It began with 18 students two years ago, and each year our numbers double. So right now we have 83 very enthusiastic and very talented students. Um, and again, it is really quite incredible to see them. You would have seen some of the members out in the foyer on your way in, Many of those students are in our intermediate section. Um, and what that means is they just picked up their instrument for the first time last year, and now they're performing for you at the caliber that they are, which is really quite impressive. Um, you'll also get the opportunity to hear some of our more advanced players in the, um, the chamber ensemble coming up a little bit later. They're hiding behind the curtain as I speak. So, what does this program offer? The Regional Strings Program will offer students an opportunity for academic enrichment within a music program. Students have the opportunity to experience um, the Strings Program at a beginner strings, intermediate, and advanced placement. So what that means is anyone is welcome. If you, have, if you have some sort of interest in music, you are welcome. So don't feel that if you don't have the skills at this point, you shouldn't be involved in a regional program. That's not the case at all. You are all welcome. So why should you select this program? As a music teacher and as someone who has had music um, be a very important part of my own life, I can give you countless reasons. Um, students share in their creativity. They share in creating masterpieces. Um, they share in having a wonderful collaborative community. But that's not all. There are many more reasons. So if you need a little bit more convincing, please watch the following film. I'll talk about that after. Did you know that every time musicians pick up their instruments, there are fireworks going off all over their brain? On the outside, they may look calm and focused, reading the music and making the precise and practice movements required. But inside their brains, there's a party going on. How do we know this? Well, in the last few decades, neuroscientists have made enormous breakthroughs in understanding how our brains work by monitoring them in real time with instruments like fMRI and PET scanners. When people are hooked up to these machines, tasks such as reading or doing math problems each have corresponding areas of the brain where activity can be observed. But when researchers got the participants to listen to music, they saw fireworks. Multiple areas of their brains were lighting up at once as they processed the sound, took it apart to understand elements like melody and rhythm, and then put it all back together into unified musical experience. And our brains do all this work in the split second between when we first hear the music and when our foot starts to tap along. But when scientists turn from observing the brains of music listeners to those of musicians, the little backyard fireworks became a jubilee. It turns out that while listening to music engages the brain in some pretty interesting activities, playing music is the brain's equivalent of a full-body workout. The neuroscientists saw multiple areas of the brain light up, 
simultaneously processing different information in intricate, interrelated, and astonishingly fast sequences. But what is it about making music that sets the brain alight? The research is still fairly new, but neuroscientists have a pretty good idea. Playing a musical instrument engages practically every area of the brain at once, especially the visual, auditory, and motor cortices. And as with any other workout, disciplined, structured practice in playing music strengthens those brain functions, allowing us to apply that strength to other activities. The most obvious difference between listening to music and playing it is that the latter requires fine motor skills, which are controlled in both hemispheres of the brain. It also combines the linguistic and mathematical precision in which the left hemisphere is more involved with the novel and creative content that the right excels in. For these reasons, playing music has been found to increase the volume and activity in the brain's corpus callosum, the bridge between the two hemispheres, allowing messages to get across the brain faster and through more diverse routes. This may allow musicians to solve problems more effectively and creatively in both academic and social settings. Because making music also involves crafting and understanding its emotional content and message, musicians often have higher levels of executive function, a category of interlinked tasks that includes planning, strategizing, and attention to detail, and requires simultaneous analysis of both cognitive and emotional aspects. This ability also has an impact on how our memory systems work. And indeed, musicians exhibit enhanced memory functions, creating, storing, and retrieving memories more quickly and efficiently. Studies have found that musicians appear to use their highly connected brains to give each memory multiple tags, such as a conceptual tag, an emotional tag, an audio tag, and a contextual tag, like a good internet search engine. So how do we know that all these benefits are unique to music as opposed to, say, sports or painting? Or could it be that people who go into music were already smarter to begin with? Neuroscientists have explored these issues, but so far they have found that the artistic and aesthetic aspects of learning to play a musical instrument are different from any other activity studied, including other arts. And several randomized studies of participants who showed the same levels of cognitive function and neural processing at the start found that those who were exposed to a period of music learning showed enhancement in multiple brain areas compared to the others. This recent research about the mental benefits of playing music has advanced our understanding of mental function, revealing the inner rhythms and complex interplay that make up the amazing orchestra of our brain. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, it's been brought to my attention that we have another vehicle, a black Nissan, A-C-K-Y, A-C-K-R-Y-T-E, is the license plate, it is completely blocking all parking if you are the owner of the black Nissan, A-C-K-Y-K-R-Y-T-E. I'm not even gonna try to say act right. A-C-K-R-Y-T-E, thank you. Thank you. So now that you've all decided that you want to be part of the Regional Strings Program, um, there are some choices that you need to make. One choice, however, that you do not need to make is whether you have to choose between Regional Strings and the Advanced Placement AP program. Um, these two programs, in fact, work quite seamlessly together. So if you're torn between, if you think you have to choose and you're torn between going down the AP route or the Strings route, you don't have to do that. You're more than welcome to take part in both. Um, however, you do need to choose some things. Our program offers um, experience with all of the main or string orchestral instruments, so that is violin, viola, cello, and double bass. And some of our, our students here would like to introduce you to these instruments.
So those are just some of the things that our string program have to offer, and there are many, many more. So I'd like to invite to the stage, to the podium, Ms. Nicole Marquez. She is the driving force and um, extreme talent behind the strings program, and she'll share some more information with you. Thank you, Ms. Collings. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'd like to take you through some great things that we offer here at the Central Peel Regional Strings Program. Our students have the opportunity to play in uh, large and small ensemble settings. They learn how to collaborate. They learn when to lead and when to follow through various ensemble opportunities. Our music literacy program has various units. Students learn music theory, composition, ear training, and we also prepare our students for an AP Music Theory exam if they so choose to take it in grade 12. Our program, like Ms. Collings mentioned, works seamlessly with the AP program, and many of our students are in both programs. For our creative enrichment component, our students learn about music history and world music, as well as music analysis and appreciation. We use Skype in the classroom to learn about music all over the world. We've traveled to Scotland, to Portugal, and this year, some of our students don't even know yet, but we will be traveling to India. There are various performance opportunities also available to our students. These experiences help them develop their leadership skills and instills confidence. School performances and collaboration and with opportunities with other departments are always happening here at Central Peel. In this photo, you see our intermediate string students performing in a Halloween flash mob in our main foyer. Our school ensembles also go out and perform in the community. For example, at the Peel District School Board office, feeder schools, and this weekend we're playing at a scholarship dinner. Our string students also have various opportunities to learn from guest musicians, clinicians, and professionals in the field. There are extracurricular opportunities also available, such as our pop strings ensemble, where the students play pop string songs on their string instruments and work on contemporary arrangements. You'll be part of a great community. By joining a strings program, you'll be part of a community of like-minded students. It is truly a positive environment and you'll for sure love to be a part of. Our students have many leadership opportunities. They get to work on skills that are transferable to any area. You'll also develop long-lasting friendships throughout the four years of our string program. I'd now like to share with you some exciting trips and events that we've also had. We go on yearly TSO concerts and rehearsal attendance. We have collaborated with Dadario Canada. They invited us to play in a music video. It was recorded at their warehouse and it was with, recorded with a Dadario artist. And this video has been published on their Canada and US websites. Yamaha Canada has also been a great sponsor of our program. They have supported us with various instruments and donated an electric quartet station. These instruments have allowed us to explore other styles of music, such as the rock piece these students were playing in this video. Yamaha even tweeted about us, and a Yamaha tweet covered our strings extravaganza event that we did here at Central Peel. Uh, we had an event with DEVA, an electric rock string ensemble. The Brampton Guardian has also covered our events. And Omni News even came by our classroom to interview our students about the great accomplishments they've had in the strings program. Now, who can apply to the regional strings program? Well, the answer is that everyone can apply. Whether you are a beginner, an intermediate, or an advanced player, this program is for you. Beginning students, to join beginning strings, you are not required to audition. Instead, you will have an interview. You will be asked about prior musical experiences, your interests, and a small listening test. 
To join the intermediate class, our players will have an audition. They will be asked to play a solo piece of their own choice, one scale in arpeggio, and a sight reading excerpt. For advanced strings, you will also have an audition. You will play two contrasting solos, a two or three octave scale, and a sight reading excerpt. All of these requirements are listed under our program website, cpregionalstrings.org. You will also find the information regarding the application process through this link, as well as videos I've shown you and photos of what we do in the program. In the, photo, um, in the folders you also received at the entrance, there's also a green sheet with all the audition requirements. Instrument rentals. So we have an um, instrument rental program with Long McQuaid, where the students need um, to rent, to rent to own, purchase uh, an instrument so that they have one at home to practice. There are various options available. Uh, cello and bass students have an instrument provided at school, so they don't carry an instrument back and forth. And violin and viola players will have a place to store their instrument in the strings room so that they don't carry it around. I'd like to thank you very much for watching our presentation, and we really do hope to see you soon. I'm going to ask you, um, after the AP presentation, to join us in room 134 for questions and answers. Um, the signs, there are green signs outside and they will lead you to the room and we also have uh, string student volunteers that will help you get there. I'm going to leave you with a brief performance uh, by our chamber string ensembles before I pass you on to the AP presentation. Thank you.
Well, once again, what a wonderful per performance by our students here at Central Peel. Could I get another warm round of applause for them? So we've done a brief overview of the Strings program here at Central Peel, and at this time I'd like to introduce Linda Robinson, the Director of Advanced Placement for Ontario, here to fill you in on the Advanced Placement program offered at Central Peel. Linda. Thank you, Mr. Colton, and good evening, everybody. Um, I'm wearing my summer clothes because I don't want winter to come, but uh, the storm tonight makes me think that maybe that's not going to happen, but let's hope for that. I'm here to talk about the AP program in general. Um, I'll talk about what it is, because I'm sure some of you don't really have a full understanding of what the AP program does, and if you do, well then just bear with us, and I hope I'll say something that you don't know. We're going to talk about AP grades and university credit, about why a student should take AP, about what a typical AP student looks like, in case you're wondering if you would make a good AP student. So what is AP? AP stands for Advanced Placement. It's a program that was developed in Princeton in the States in the 1950s when students were all in one stream in school and there was no differentiation between students who were at the low end of the academic scale and those at the higher end. And the teachers then, as they do today, automatically enriched these students. They often worked above and beyond the, uh, the high school uh, program and when they got to university they were rather bored because they'd covered a lot of that material. So the College Board, which is an association of North American colleges and universities, got together and said, let's create an exam that reflects what is typically taught in a first-year university course. And all of the universities in the College Board agreed that if students performed well on this exam, then they could advance in university's second year course rather than first year course. So that's the origin of the program. So it's a program designated for motivated high school students to allow them to take university level material, to develop university level thinking, and to write university level exams while they are still in high school. These courses are taught by high school teachers right here at Central Peel. And there are 34 different AP courses available in 21 different subjects. And these are taught in conjunction with usually the 4U Ontario program. So the students will take the Ontario program and at the same time be enriched so that they do well on the AP exam. The courses are developed by uh, test pr uh, preparation teams of university professors who know what is typically taught in a first-year university biology course, for example, and experienced AP high school teachers who know what students of that age can absorb and how they learn best. The exams are written here at Central Peel in May, and each exam is about three hours long and is approximately 50% multiple choice 50% free response. I can see the students are getting excited at the thought that they're going to get the opportunity to write a three-hour exam, right? Yeah. Um, the only exception to this is the art program, and for the art program, students submit a, polio, a portfolio of their works. Four pieces of art are submit, submitted, and the rest are submitted digitally. Now, you might be thinking, how can high school students cover all the work there is in high school and maybe taking the strings program as well and on top of that <clears throat> be prepared to write a university level exam well the answers to these questions are hidden up here on the screen first one is this is a program for students who are motivated if you're a solid 55% student and that's exactly where you like to stay, it's probably not the program for you. But if you're passionate about one subject or two subjects or all subjects and you really like to learn, you've got the motivation to do the extra work that, because of course there will be some extra work at this, then the program might be right for you. The second key factor here is, it's taught by your high school teachers. 
If you think back to parents, if you went to university, how many students were in first year university courses? Or students, if you've talked to your older brothers and sisters or cousins, you know that often there are a thousand students in a first year university class. Here at Central Peel, you might have 30 students in your AP class. The university professor doesn't know the students by name, doesn't really have any vested interest in how well they do in the course. Here at Peel, these teachers will have taught you probably in grade nine or 10 or 11. They will know you. They know your strengths, your weaknesses. They know how far you have to come. And the other real advantage here at Peel is that there is a very, very solid and well-prepared pre-AP program, which means that the university content and preparation for that starts not in grade 12 or grade 11 when you're writing the AP exam, but in your first year here in the grade 9 program, so that the enrichment is spread over four years. Okay. The um, other factor here is that these courses are taught in conjunction with Ontario courses. And our Ontario program is very strong. About 80% in most courses of the material that's on the AP exam is also on the Ontario curriculum. So it's not as if they're having to teach an entire new curriculum. What the teachers will be doing will, is broadening and deepening their presentation of the Ontario material. Now, the next concern, or perhaps the first concern, is, OK, this is harder stuff. My marks are going to suffer. How can I have a higher mark if I'm doing harder work? This, too, comes from the idea that this is in conjunction with the Ontario program. The report card mark is a report card mark based on content, assessment, and evaluation of the Ontario course. Legally, it cannot reflect what you've done in the AP component of the course. The mark for the AP component is a post-secondary mark, and that mark is determined solely by the student's performance on the AP exam. So think about it now. You're studying your subject in greater breadth and depth than students who are not in the enriched AP or pre-AP program. Are you going to do better or worse on the Ontario curriculum? You're going to do better. There's a very smart boy in the front row here nodding his head. Yes, you're going to do better, aren't you? Because you're better prepared for that material. So this is, this is an important factor that no, your marks will not suffer. OK. Now, just a few statistics for you, because I'm sure people here like statistics. In the world last year, there were 4.5 million AP exams written in about 115, 120 different countries. The fastest growing new countries for AP are India and China. Japan and Korea both have strong AP programs. There's only one version of the AP exam, and that's in English. So those students are having to write the exams in a second language. Most of you here, I'm sure, have the advantage that English is the language you're used to writing exams in. In Canada last year, we had over 28,000 exams and about 625 schools spread across the country. And in Ontario, 8,250 exams in 250 schools that offered the exams. But there's over 300 AP and pre-AP schools, schools that are starting to prepare the students for them. Now, you might be asking yourself, how well do students do on the exams? And what is the evaluation like? Something funny's happened to my slide. OK. The uh, exams are graded on a scale of 5 to 1. You'll see that the happy face gets smaller, OK? But that the bottom one isn't an unhappy face. It's not a happy face, but it's not an unhappy face. Because even if you write the exam and you get only a 1 or a 2, you are going to university with four years of enrichment that other students who just took the regular Ontario course do not have. And the studies have shown that you will do better at university. You will graduate faster and with higher marks than students who do not take APs. 
Now, once again, the idea of marks comes up. These are not marks. These are recommendations. It's up to the university that receives them to decide what that means for them. In British Columbia, the universities like to assign a mark to AP recommendation grades. So at Simon Fraser University and the University of British Columbia, if you get a five on your AP exam, you get a 96% in that course. If you get a four, you get 86, and if you get a three, you get an 80. In Ontario, the universities tend not to give you a mark. They will give you a pass or a fail, or they will give you a credit or no credit, okay? Once again, I'd like to assure you that getting a poor mark is never going to be able to harm you. It's a win-win situation. If you get a one or a two or a three, nobody else knows about that. Central Peel, your teachers will be able to see what mark you got, but they cannot submit a mark to a university. The only person that owns that mark is you, the student. So you write the exam, you find out what you got, and then you decide if you want to give this mark to the university to see what they're going to do with it. And in um, Canadian universities, they want you to receive a four or a five on, this, on the AP exam. And then they will consider you, oh, sorry, this is the wrong slide. I'm not, I'm not looking at myself, okay. And I've given you the answer, oh shucks, okay. Um, how do Ontario students do on the AP exams, okay? So, which mark, one, two, three, four, or five, do you think most Ontario students get on the exam? Three or four? Okay, well, you know how many get a five, because I've showed you that, okay? How many get a four? That's over 50% already. And a three? Over 75%. And who are the ones and twos? Okay. So it is not only doable, it's almost easy. <laughs> Particularly if you're in a school that has a pre-AP program and a strong supporting background for you. Okay? We also have what we call in Ontario, or in Canada, AP National Scholars. And AP National Scholars are students that get, write at least five AP exams, a lot of them write 10 or 11, but they write at least five AP exams and they get fours and fives on all of them. And typically in Ontario each year we have over 150 students that write five AP exams and gets usually fives on all of them. So we are a very, very successful region. We have one of the highest pass, pass rates in AP. The typical um, area gets maybe a 2.7 uh, is the average student mark. In Ontario, it's 3.7, okay. So successful completion in on, in. Ontario and in Canada is considered to be a four or a five on an AP exam. A lot of American universities will consider a three as successful, but we have a slightly higher standards here in Canada. Uh, so what does that mean if you get a four or a five? The university can offer you a transfer credit, advanced placement, which means you don't have to take the first year course in that subject, you can go into the second year course, or both. And let me just talk a little bit about the difference here. Um, if you want to major in history at Queen's, for example, Queen's recognizes that there are three AP history courses. There's US, World, and European. Should you write all three history exams and get a four and five on all of them, Queen's history department will give you three history credits the moment you walk through the door. Okay? So you have got credits. They are unusual, though, in that they say, but we won't give anybody advanced placement in history because we want every student who majors in history here to take our foundation year history course. So they know how we write our papers. They know how we do a bibliography. We know how we organize ourselves. So in that case, and this is rare, the student doesn't get the advanced placement. They have to take first year, but they do get the credit. Now, a lot of students say, but I don't think I want to go into second year. What if my, my science teachers didn't teach me everything that's on the course? Well, if you got a four or five on the exam, then your science teachers taught you everything that's important on that course. You wouldn't have got that mark if you hadn't been taught just about everything that was necessary. 
But Americans are not happy with this facile answer. So they did a study a few years ago in Texas, where everything's big, 78,000 students. And these were students who all came from the same AP schools, the same socioeconomic background, and went to the same universities. And what they did was they studied students who went grade 12 AP, first year university in a particular course, second year university in that course. And they compared them with students who went the same AP high school, decided to take the advanced placement, and then went directly from grade 12 AP into second year university. Which group do you think got better marks in second year? The first group who did first year university at there, or the second group? The person over here who said the second group is right. The second group of students got better marks. Now let's think about why that would be. The type of student that thrives in an AP class in this type of environment likes a challenge. If they'd done the AP exam and they got a five, they go to first year university and they're sitting there and they're bored. They've done this before. They're not being stimulated. They're not being challenged. But if they go into the second year, they're being challenged. So think about that. Don't undersell yourself. You probably can do the second course. There are some cases where you might not want to. If you're going into medical school, medical schools look at your first and second year university marks. So it is in your interest to get the highest possible mark in first and second year university. So you have to sit there and tell yourself not to be bored, but allow yourself to be challenged so that you can get really high marks. Or perhaps you wrote biology, chemistry, but you didn't write calculus, and first year calculus can be a killer course, then you've got more time to study for the calculus because the biology and chemistry courses are going to be easier for you to do. Okay? The other thing is university, uh, sorry, engineering courses, science courses are of a higher grade than general science courses. Uh, if you're going to engineering at Waterloo, they offer a special diploma and written right into it, it says all courses must be taken at Waterloo. That doesn't mean that students in engineering at Waterloo didn't do APs. The opposite is true. I talked to an ex-student of mine who was in engineering at Waterloo, and I said, so, your APs? She said, anybody who didn't do APs can't keep up. You absolutely have to have them for the pace of an engineering course here at Waterloo, okay? So, we want this. The AP courses are recognized, I say in 90% of post-secondary institutions in North America, by all Ontario universities, by the way, have an AP policy. It's not always the same. It's up to the university to decide what their policy is going to be. York University says, if you write 17 APs and get fours and fives and all, then we'll give you 17 university credits. But other universities say, no, we'll give you up to three, or we'll give you up to five, or we'll recognize these APs, but not those. So it's it's up to the university, and when you get there to the university, probably for your orientation, you have had your transcript sent along if you're interested, and you say, what are you gonna do for me? Okay, are you gonna give me advanced placement? Are you gonna give me credit? And the university policies are getting broader and broader as we go along. Now, it's only 90% because community colleges are not usually the destination of AP students, so they haven't had to sit down and develop an AP policy because they don't get very many students who do APs and then go to community college. They may do APs, university, and then go to a community college for some specific job training, but it's not a normal route. 600, over 600 universities throughout the world. I once had a student who was given provisional acceptance to Oxford. Yeah, the Oxford in England. And the provision was she had to get fours and fives on all her AP exams. She didn't. She lost her acceptance to Oxford. So these exams are recognized by all the universities throughout the world. So, I mentioned AP. AP is the year in which the student writes the AP exam. And that's usually in grade 12, but there are some here at Central Peel that are being offered in, in grade 11. Um, and the students can start to write their APs then. Pre-AP is the idea, as I've said, that the enrichment is spread throughout the high school career, okay? So the courses have been designed 
so that the teachers of grade 9 and 10 know what the AP exam looks like, know what the students have to know, and know where they have to be for success when they're at the end of their grade 12 year or whichever year they're writing their AP exam in. Central Appeal teachers have been trained. They know what the techniques are, what the skills are, what the habits of mind are of students who are going to be successful on the AP exams. And emphasis, as emphasis, we've heard already here is on 21st century learning, problem solving, thinking, um, and um, uh, inquiry-based activities in the classroom, okay? So, why should a student take AP? It sounds like a lot of extra work, doesn't it? And maybe extra stress. So here are my thoughts. And number one is not going to be the university credit. You'll be surprised at how far down my list that is. I think the main reason is for the enrichment and the challenge that it gives the student. It allows a student to enhance his or her individual strengths. You don't have to take five APs or seven APs. You take as many as you want to take. And you take them in the subjects that you want to take them in. APs allow you to play a role and be an active learner. Your AP teachers are going to encourage you to go off on tangents, to delve more deeply, to do research on your own. You often get a list from teachers of these are the topics for the next essay. If you're the type of student that says, oh, but could I do an essay on this instead? They'll think about it and say, yeah, I didn't think of that. Go ahead. So that you'll be able to play a much more active role definite emphasis on the 21st century skills, which are not only necessary for success at university, but for success in the working world after that. You will be in a class of like-minded students. Everybody in your pre-AP class is in pre-AP English or pre-AP science or pre-AP math. Everybody in your AP class will be preparing to write the same calculus exam or the same history exam. They will be the same type of learners as you are, the type of student that likes the challenge in the class. You will definitely be a step ahead at university. You will have done the same type of projects, thinking, and written university level exams before you even get to university. Once again, a little anecdote about a student of mine who was in philosophy. There's no AP philosophy, but she was taking philosophy at university. And she said, when the professor gave back the first essay, he um, asked her to remain behind after the class. She was a little bit worried about this. And he congratulated her and said, you were the only student in the class that knew how to write an essay. You knew how to do a thesis statement, supporting evidence, a conclusion, and you didn't pad it. And she said, I learned that in my AP economics class. So that the skills that you're learning may not be in the subjects you're going to take at university, but they're going to be applicable to what you do in university. Remember, even the calculus exam is 50% free response where you have to express yourself. Communication is very, very important. And the last one I put is the credit you get at university. This allows you to take electives, for example. If you've got four or five AP subjects already, take a course first year that's just for fun so that you don't have to worry. I'm not doing this to stress myself out. I did it because I wanted to learn to speak Italian, and I don't care what mark I get in this course. If you want to do a double major, you might arrive at the university with two, three social science credits and two English credits, and you're not going to take five years to do a double major as most people do. You can probably do it in four years. So there's all sorts of options that open up for you. If you're trying to keep a scholarship, You've got this advanced learning that's going to help you get the high marks you need to maintain your scholarship. Or a daughter of a friend of mine went to McGill. She had three AP credits already. So second half of second year university, she went to South America and did volunteer work and uh, perfected her Spanish because she already had those credits with her. So now, oh, helping you in the admissions process. In Ontario, the admissions process is a big, big computer at the University of Guelph. Um, so it's not influenced by AP or not. It only asks you one question. Will you have written any AP exams by June of your graduating year? And so the universities will know that you're an AP student if they want to know this. If, however, you are applying to a special program or you're applying for a scholarship, there will be a supplemental 
application form for the universities, and that's where you can say, and I will have written seven AP exams, and on the ones I wrote in grade 11, I got fours and fives. If you are applying to the states, you have to have APs. That is the enrichment program in the states. People who apply and don't have APs are not in the preferred file from the beginning, okay? Now, this is a new slide for me, so I have to look at it uh, and see what it says. These are some myths and realities. I thought you might like that. Um, they're just for students who always get good marks. As I mentioned, if you're a solid 55% student, it may not be for you. But you don't have to have top marks. The important thing is that you are motivated and you want to do it, that you're interested in this subject. The courses are so stressful. Yes, everything worth working for is stressful. But don't forget, you're in a class where everybody is under the same stress, so you can share it with your friends, and the teachers are aware of this, so that the teachers are on your side in that as well. Third one, I don't think I'll score high enough. Well, as I've said, you don't have to get a five. Get a four or a five. Get a one or a two or a three, and it's still going to make you more successful at university. And one other thing, how many people here want to be doctors or lawyers? Okay, to become a doctor or a lawyer, you're too old, yeah, sorry. <laughs> to become a doctor or a lawyer, you have to write the MCATs or the LSATs. These are the same people that make up and determine the format of the AP exam. So if you've written five AP courses, you've had five experiences of writing this type of exam where the results aren't going to change your life. So don't make the MCAT the first time you walk in and write one of this type of exams because it's very disappointing if you don't get a high enough mark in that. And the fourth myth is taking, your, taking AP courses could harm your marks. We've been through this already. It shouldn't lower your marks. It should make your marks higher, okay? Now, this is my unscientific slide, okay? This is what I have sort of observed by talking to AP students talking to AP parents, and did I say I was an AP parent myself? I've lived through it. I know what the stressful periods are like, okay? So, AP students are, they tend to be, higher academic achievers. They are definitely intellectually curious. They like to ask the questions. They like to ask the questions the teacher can't answer. They are not the type of students that run home as soon as the bell rings to do their homework, they're the ones that stay behind, they're probably the ones that are setting up outside to run the tours, they're the ones up here that were playing the strings, they're in student government, they do volunteer work, they are the athletes of the school, they run the student newspaper, they love to debate. Do you have a reach for the top team here? Not yet, well that goes very well with AP, something like reach for the top, okay. They are self-starters and independent learners. I am sure the parents here um, come to the students and say, did you remember you have a test tomorrow? The non-AP student might say, oh yeah, I forgot about that. The AP student's gonna say, mom, it's under control. I've gotta go back to the school tonight for the information night. I studied for that test two days ago. That's what the pre-AP student is like. They are often very passionate about learning, maybe only about one subject or two subjects, and often avid readers. They are also often very idealistic and committed to their goals. Now, this doesn't apply to all students. Maybe none of these apply, but these are just some of the observations I've made. And this is the one that makes the parents laugh. They're well organized and have good time management skills. Now, how many students here have had your parents walk into your bedroom and say, this room is a mess? Right, and what did you answer? You say, I can find whatever I need to find, right? <laughs> okay, yeah. Because you're well organized. And <laughs> it's just not somebody else's idea of organization. And if we go up here to number three, energetic and involved in school life. You can't be energetic and involved in school life and a successful AP student if you don't have good time management skills. My daughter's teachers were always coming to me and saying, will you please tell your daughter 
She has to drop something. She can't take all those APs and be the head of the student government and be in all the band and, and musical things and be in sports. And I'd say, well, you tell her yourself. She won't listen to me. So this is the type of student that does this. And the good time management skills aren't always evident, but you will find that they are really useful. And sometimes students will develop them subversively. <laughs> okay? Have to be a student that is willing to take risks, academic risks. I'm not talking about jumping off the CN Tower. Okay? I'm talking about saying, okay, huh, I wish I'd had more time to study for that AP exam, but you know, it can't do me any harm, and I'm going to learn something by doing it. All my friends are dropping AP. I'm going to stay in it because I think there's something in it for the long run. And then the last one is you have a supportive family. If you didn't have a supportive family, they wouldn't be here with you tonight. So you already have one thing on that list. Your parents know that this is really hard for you, and you're willing to do it, and you're wanting to do it. Okay? So I'm now going to turn the microphone over to Ms. Matei, who is the head of the Advanced Placement Program here at Central Peel. Thank you so much, Ms. Robinson. It's an honor to have you again with us here at Central Peel. Just give me a second to uh, switch the presentations. And here we go. Um, my name is uh, Simona Matei. I'm a math teacher. And I'm also the head of regional programs, Advanced Placement and Strings, here at Central Peel. Uh, my role tonight uh, is to, uh, to speak about how AP looks here at Central Peel. And you will notice the similarities between what I am going to say and what you've heard from Ms. Robinson. <clears throat> Um, Mr. Colton mentioned is in his um, uh, introduction that um, Central Peel is quite a unique school. It is a school that has shown in the past years a strong commitment to uh, 21st century teaching and learning. And the AP uh, teachers have done the same thing. But <clears throat> we didn't consider AP just a set of exams. For us, we wanted to build here, to design here, a comprehensive program that starts in grade nine. Um, and what we have done, we, uh, <clears throat> we uh, enhanced the, sc uh, the school framework, the one that Mr. Colton was talking about, and we developed what we call the advanced placement uh, guiding principle. And you have a summary of these principles you have here in the visual that you see uh, right over here. <clears throat> Uh, this visual is uh, uh, divided <clears throat> between two parts, the, the top of the arch, which represents the objectives of the program, and you will see that the central objective, the most important part of the program is the focus on critical thinking and problem solving. A critical skill for the 21st century, no doubt about that, <clears throat> supported by knowledge and understanding, and also supported by our emphasis on developing independent learners. Communication and creativity are also important 21st century skills and also part main objectives for the advanced placement. But I think we can agree that all these academic objectives wouldn't mean too much without strengths of character and without uh, the ability to demonstrate, to demonstrate the strengths of character through leadership opportunities. Now, at the, at the lower part of our visual, of our framework, we have the means to accomplish, uh, to accomplish the objectives. And you will notice already words that are already familiar to you. High expectation, rigor, enrichment. I won't mention all of them. I will focus on two important ones. First one is a mentoring piece. We put a lot of uh, emphasis on mentoring here. We know that the AP program is a challenging program. However, uh, our teachers and our administrators have developed over the years the mechanisms to support students in their endeavor. 
Um, I also want to mention assessment and evaluation. And again, I'll go along with what uh, Ms. Robinson has said already. Uh, we know that people believe that because you are taking a more difficult course, an AP course in particular in this case, the marks should be lower. That's not true. That's simply not true. Uh, our teachers have worked really, really, really hard over the years to align their assessment and evaluation pro um, practices so that they reward students for the extra work they do. They do not punish them. So that's really, really important to remember. So how does an AP class look like? Expect an enhanced environment where issues, where students are allowed to dig deeper into the issues with, very important, share their learning with like-minded pe uh, peers, extremely important. <clears throat> um, one of the main advantages to come to Central Peel and do AP is definitely uh, the university connection. <coughs> but make no mistake, AP is hard work. However, it's a different kind of work. It's a work that allows you to think outside the box. To sum up, I can say, I can assure, assure you that AP is a different kind of classroom. Now, who else could speak better about an AP classroom but some exceptional AP students? And we have here with us Gurleen Kalotti and Joseph Latorkai. Please welcome them. Good evening to all. My name is Gurleen Kalodi, and I'd like to share my experiences of being as a NAP student at Central Peel for the past two years. So from the moment I entered an AP classroom, I noticed a difference right away in the teacher's approach, in the attitude of my classmates, but most importantly, over time, in my way of thinking. Unlike the past, in AP classrooms, the focus is not on memorizing facts and figures. For example, many grade eight students know the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus B squared equals C squared. But how many of us ever challenge and question the formula? In AP, we're given the chance to study subjects in greater depth and detail and understand how these formulas are actually derived. We engage in intense discussions, solve problems individually and collaboratively, and learn to write clearly, precisely, and persuasively. AP students are required to reason, analyze, and understand for themselves. Students develop the ability to learn independently and seek knowledge tirelessly. For me, this is perhaps the most exciting part of AP, to go out and explore on my own, to broaden my intellectual horizons. It's no secret that AP courses can be challenging, but it's also no secret that only through challenges can we achieve true personal growth. To some, this might, this might sound like a great this might sound like a recipe for a great deal of stress, but in collaborative classrooms, the support we receive from our teachers and like-minded peers helps ease our worries. So, to conclude, if you are an academically inclined and highly motivated student, AP is the perfect program for you. Hi, my name is Joe, and I'm both an AP and Regional Strings student in grade 11 here at Central Peel. I've been in both programs in grade 9 and have, nothing, have experienced nothing but good things. Since the beginning of grade 9, two years ago, my non-AP friends in gym class or the basketball team or another extracurricular activity would ask me if AP is extremely difficult with a constant stream of tests and five hours of homework every night. That is simply not the case. There isn't more work in AP so much as there is more in-depth work. You go deeper into the same subjects. If you work hard and stay organized, it is very possible to do well in all your classes. Don't get me wrong, AP isn't for everybody. It is for students who want to do well, who want to succeed and have a strong desire for knowledge. Strings is also an exceptional program. 
The teachers there push you so that you sound as good as you can when you play your instrument. They want you not only to succeed, but thrive in the program. When I started in grade 9, I was a beginner on the double bass. The teachers wanted me to do well, so they worked with me, and by the start of grade 10, I was in the advanced class. From the moment I began the program, I was met with enthusiasm and confidence from everyone involved. Even before I had chosen the base, Ms. Marquez and the other administrators had faith that I could be great. They will put in the work and the time for you. If you put in the practicing time and the effort back in, you will be amazed and thrilled by what you can achieve in both these programs. Thank you. I would now like to give the stage to Mr. Wardlaw from the Geography Department. How do you follow that? Uh, okay, I'm here to talk to you about, um, let's just get going. Uh, okay, see, I can't follow that. All right, I'm here to talk to you about the differences between the AP program and the IB program, because some of you may be thinking quite seriously about the IB program and going, what's the difference between the two? I, encourage you to go to the Turner Fenton night. I don't know the date, but I encourage you to go to it so you have the most information available to you when you make a decision about the two. First, what I'd like to tell you is that they are both an exceptional and academic programs, and they both are strong foundations for universities. However, that's pretty much where the similarities ends, because ours is much more flexible and there's a big cost difference. Let's first talk about the flexibility. Well, both programs make you take certain courses in grade 9 and grade 10. The IB program then continues into grade 11 and 12, and it makes you take programs you may not want to take. Let me give you an example. Please understand this is only an example. Let's say that you do not like geography, but I'm a geography teacher. Let's just say you do not like geography, but you love math or you love science. Geography stresses you out, but math doesn't. You do not have to take AP geography. You will in the IB program, but in the AP program, you do not have to. This allows you to concentrate on your mathematics and if you want to take geography at the high school level, you can and get a normal high school credit with no penalties. So that's one about flexibility. The other one is cost. There's a huge difference in cost. The AP program is $200 in grade 9, $200 in grade 10, $200 in grade 11, and $200 in grade 12. The IB program is $200 in grade 9, $200 in grade 10, and then it can go up to $1,250 in grade 11 and even more in grade 12. The reason being is because the AP teachers talk to each other worldwide. We share our information. The IB program, they're not allowed to. They have to buy their material and they're not allowed to share it. They must stay within the legal ramifications of that. So AP is a much more sharing, cooperative learning environment. Whoops, wrong way. Okay, now I'm not gonna bore you about a student profile because you've heard it. So very quickly, I just wanna reiterate, you need intellectual curiosity. You have to have an interest in learning. You have to be a motivated student. You have to have a great work ethic. You have to be able to take initiative. You have to have academic proficiency. And least, last but not least, you must have great parent support and we already have that just looking around this room. So now, I'd like to turn everything over to Ms. Allsworth. Okay, so I'm just gonna cover a few uh, 
particulars about when your child comes to Central Peel is ex accepted into the program and how they get accepted into the program. So first off, we're going to talk about a grade 9, 10 pre-AP student. We call it a pre-AP because they're not writing exams until they get into grade 12, sometimes in grade 11. But in pre-AP, every one of your children will take the compulsory subjects, which are Ministry of Ontario compulsory subjects, which include math, English, science, geography, and French. It switches to history in grade 10, but your AP student will also be allowed to take three optional courses in grade 9. If a student is accepted into both the strings and the AP program, they will again take those five compulsory subjects, but they will also take two credits in strings, one course each semester, and they will again have an optional course. Now, a student who's taking the strings only program, they will take the uh, two strings courses, one each semester, in addition to the regular academic or applied math, English, science, geography, and French. Now, as Mr. Wardlaw said, the nice thing about our AP program is once they get to grade 11 and 12, it really is up to them to design their timetable and what courses they want to take. So we know that AP offers many options, over 30 courses and exams, uh, and our students get to choose what they are interested in taking. So yes, they could be the student who's interested in the mathematics and the sciences. They could be the student who's interested in business and economics, or perhaps the arts, humanities, social sciences. We also find with our current grade 11 students, we have our first grade 11 class this year, uh, over 100 students in AP, and what we're finding is many of them like to be cross-curricular. We see them taking the science and the maths, but we also see them taking the psychology or the economics courses. We do have a program here, two programs that a student can also attach uh, into their portfolio once they get into grade 11, which are specialist high schools major programs. We have two. Uh, we have the business program, which has been uh, well established in the school for many years. And this year, we started our brand new sports SHSM, uh, specialist high schools major. So again, uh, for a student who's doing uh, grade 11 and 12 strings, they will be required to take two courses. Those are their two strings courses for grade 11 and grade 12, but the door is completely open to what those other six courses will be in grade 11 and 12. So, next steps. You've, just, you've come this evening and you've decided you do want to apply. You're interested in applying to the AP program or the strings program. We do encourage you to look at our website. There's information in your uh, pamphlet about our website, and there is a readiness questionnaire that you can ask yourself. Are you ready for AP and strings? Discuss it with your parent guardian, and do include your grade eight teachers. You will need to um, complete an online application. The application will open October 28th, so it's not open quite yet but you will be able to access it through the website, Central Peel, and the application closes November 20th. You will have to include information about yourself as a student, your readiness, and your leadership experiences. The fee for the application itself is $40. That is a standard fee for all regional programs across Peel. Let me just slide back. Uh, we will invite 500 applicants to come and write our assessment. The assessment will be Saturday, November 28th, and it will take place at the school here, and it starts at 10 a.m. You will be informed by email regarding that invitation. We look at many different things when choosing our students uh, to be accepted into the program. This includes your grade seven term one marks, uh, as a result of the reporting last year, we are using your Term 1 marks. Your Grade 8 Progress Report, if it is available this year, we will be looking at that, including your uh, learning skills. The Math and Literacy Evaluation that you will write here on November 28th, and the responses that you write on our reflection in your application. For strings, we've already heard about the audition process. 
or if you're a beginner, the interview process. But again, you must apply online. There is the registration fee and your interview or your audition will also be on November 28th. These timelines are found in your package on the yellow insert and uh, you should keep those available for you because they're very important. Uh, once you've got your application complete and you re receive an email from us inviting you to the assessment, you need to attend that assessment or the audition for strings. We will be making offers February, tw February 8th. That's our first round of offers. We do a second round of offers on February 16th. All regional programs follow these exact same dates in Peel. It is important to note that if uh, you have applied outside to other programs as well, and we know that many students who are considering regional programs are considering more than one, uh, you need to understand that once you accept a program, so if you do receive an offer in the first round and you accept a program at, let's say, um, Central Peel for AP, that will be confirmed and other programs will no longer make an offer to you. So it's really important that going into the offer date, February 8th, that you know where your priorities are and what your first choice is. The only exception is you may accept two regional programs at Central Peel. So a student may accept two regional programs because you can accept advanced placement and strings at Central Peel. Some of our parents and students have busing concerns because we know we draw students from all over Brampton, North, East Brampton. We, uh, we visit those schools and we know students come to Central Peel from there. We do have a busing company out in the main foyer who's uh, available to talk to you about how you can purchase a seat on their private busing to have your student picked up immediately in their area and brought to the school and then returned at the end of the day. So it's a great option. Please talk to them if you would like to find out more about the busing. And with that, we're going to bring it to a close with Mr. Colton's last words. Thank you. So thank you once again, uh, Ms. Allworth and all our presenters this evening. Uh, right now, I'm sure you've had a lot of information presented to you, and you probably have a lot of questions. So we're going to run a question info answer session. We're going to do that in our cafeteria. Uh, there'll be our staff members will be holding. Oh, let me take one. Yep. staff members because it will be hard to see with the sheer volume of people. We'll be holding yellow signs like this. If you see a person holding a yellow sign, they know about our regional programs and you're free to approach them and ask your questions. That's just to help you locate us in the cafeteria. Also room 134 is the uh, strings room. If you're interested in the regional program for strings, uh, questions and answers can be found in room 134, which is down the far hall towards the back end and we'll have some students out there assisting you find that room and again somebody with a yellow sign can also point you in that direction. At this time I would like to conclude tonight's presentation. I'd like to thank once again all our presenters and all the students and staff that were here tonight to assist and thank you to you the parents that took time out of your busy schedules to join us here at Central Peel and for considering regional strings and regional AP. Thank you very much and let's enjoy.